Hello and welcome to our special edition of Politiki. We are still on day two of the ANC's fifth national policy conference. We are coming to you live from the Nazareth Expo Center. As we said throughout the week until next week, Wednesday, we will be breaking down the happenings here, speaking to the power brokers within the ANC, giving you in-depth analysis and our reporters giving you the stories as they break. Right now, we're joined by one power broker within the ANC. It is the North Northwest uh, Premier, the Northwest ANC Chairperson, Supra Mahuma Pelu, and I will be joined by my colleague, political reporter, T.D. Madia, as we talk to Northwest and its contribution to this very key uh, conference of the ANC. Mr. Mahuma Pelu, thank you and welcome to Politiki. Oh, good morning and thank you very much. And we thought, you know, let's start with what is the issue that is being debated right now. It is the diagnostic report by the Secretary General, Gwede Mantashe, but already it started off with divisions, with some who did not want it to be presented. What, what exactly happened there? No, I, I don't think that uh, delegates were opposed to the diagnostic report. The point that, uh, because it's new, it, it was for the first time that you have a diagnostic report being presented in a policy conference. People were just asking if it's not possible for it to become part of the organizational report in December. Simple. And they were saying maybe what could happen is that the report must be generated by structures on the ground, not by the National Executive Committee. So the proposal was that uh, it must go to the structures and as part of discussions towards December, it then goes to the national conference. So there's nothing uh, to worry about there. And uh, <clears throat> obviously the report paints uh, the ANC as a party that is in need of some serious, serious healing. Uh, there's a myriad of problems that it points to. And more importantly, the growing distance between the ANC and the electorate. The African National Congress has to be self-critical at all times. For us to be relevant, we must be self-critical constructively. And we must be honest to the masses of our people as the ANC. Where there are weaknesses, we must not hide them. And uh, we need to communicate them as objectively and as truly as possible to our people so that pe people can see that we are an organization that can be trusted. When we have problems, we don't sweep them under uh, the carpet. So it's very important for the ANC to be truthful to itself and the people if it wants the people to continue to vote for, for the ANC. So we have acknowledged some of the challenges that we are, we are facing. But I think that I must explain one thing. Uh, I know you were going to ask me this question. The, we need to explain to people what is uh, state capture because that report also talks about state capture. It, it dominates. Yes, but uh, uh, people have to understand what is the state. The state is constituted by three branches. The way people understand it now, people think the state is the executive only. Now the state is the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature, right? So when, there, when you say there's a state capture, you mean the three arms of the state are fully Kept. But there is no evidence that has suggested that um, there is any private influence on the judiciary or even I was coming there. Mm -hmm. I was coming there. That there's no evidence that the judiciary and parliament are influenced somehow. What I think people wanted to propagate is the issue of corruption. But they, they, they put it as if it's a, a state capture. So our view as a province is that... Um, Let's talk about corruption, its specific instances, how we deal with it and confront it, instead of hiding behind the state capture. If we think that, for instance, the Guptas are involved in corruption, let's isolate those instances and say we think they're involved in these instances of corruption, follow the rule of law, report them, let there be investigations. If they are on the wrong side of the law, they must face the might of the law, as simple as that, because no one is above the law in this country. But Supra, what do you make, though, of, you mentioned the Guptas, you and I have discussed the Guptas at large, yeah. the fact that a family appears in ANC conversations, in ANC documents, for the first time in history, there is a family that's named that the ANC must now 
engage with the idea of this family and its influence on leaders within the party. What do you make of that and what do you expect us as a general public to make of that and about the ANC? It is the hatred that people have for President Zuma within the, some of the leadership of the ANC. Because some of us within the leadership of the ANC, we know the relationship between President Zuma's family and the Gupta family. We now want to put that in the open so that we deal with his character uh, as a person. So we are, we are not brave enough to talk to him politically about uh, how we think he's leading the country. So we embark on a proxy uh, war. I mean, it doesn't mean that some of the leaders, we don't have relationships with business people. Now, you can imagine an ANC whose leadership is not going to have a relationship with business people. We must say, leadership of the ANC can have relationship with business people. What we must guard against, it is leadership of the ANC being influenced or being manipulated in one way or another, at the expense of the organization's integrity or at the expense of the, the, the people themselves on the ground. So that's what we need to guard as far as I'm concerned. But are you seriously trying to play down what has been revealed so far? No, let, me just, let me just break it down. We've already established that there is a very close relationship to President Jacob Zuma. He has called them his friends. That is one, nothing illegal about that. But now we have a complicated matter. We have his son, who has been a business partner of the Gupta family, and now the Gupta family has been leaked to confidential cabinet papers that have been given to them. It is businesses that they have acquired from state-owned entities, um, which was in favor of others that could have uh, been part of that. We've got ministers that are close to President Jacob Zuma that have traveled to the Gupta family, that have visited the family. The family knew when President Jacob Zuma was going to make executive changes, and they were the ones phoning individuals to say that if you become a minister, this is what we will do. Clearly. That should worry you. That should be defined as state capture. It's not state capture. What, what I'm saying is that uh, what we need to do is to say, yes, there is this information about the Guptas and their relationship with the Zuma family, which the president in the past uh, has also confirmed and, and spoken about. He has not denied that um, his son is involved in business like any other person here in South Africa. Those rights are in the Constitution. Now that there is that evidence, right, it's not yet tested in the courts of law. What we should be doing as South Africa now is to say, now there is this information, let's not make all this noise. Let's take paper by paper, trail by trail, and subject that to the due processes of the law, and the law must take its course. If, if the Guptas are found to be on the, right, on the wrong side, of the law, the law must be merciless with them. And that is the day the relationship between them and the leadership of the ANC must be brought to an end. Do you see that actually happening, Supra? You know, you've got a lot of people in the ANC speaking about the judicial inquiry. It's a decision taken by the NEC. The president has, has said he wants to establish it. He is challenging an aspect of the findings by public protector Tudima Donzella in court. However, the interesting thing about the ANC is some are saying from 1994, from 1948, from the period that Tudima Donzella said it should be looked into. So it almost feels like the idea was to say, let's tell them we want it, but not give them definitive, a definitive answer. Let's play around with the idea of the frames of reference. So we go nowhere. Because for us as the public, it feels like it's just talk and it's not actually going to materialize. We'll never know for sure whether this issue should go to a court so we see what's actually happening with the Gupta family and its so-called influence. One thing that South Africans must learn to internalize and appreciate is that democracy is very sophisticated. When you make allegations, even when you make conclusions like the public protector has suggested the remedial action, the former public protector, we are a democracy. Everybody, including the head of state, has got the rights enshrined in the constitution to use the, the law to challenge some of the things that are there. Now, that's part, part of thriving democracy in South Africa. So what the society has to understand in South Africa is that we have to be patient with all these processes of democracy because it's part of deepening democracy here in South Africa. You must act within the law. So if the president is acting within the law, we must allow him, like a citizen, 
like a state president, to act within the law, as long as he's not breaking the law. So we need to live with some of the pains that comes with uh, democracy. But um, you paint a picture of we have to wait for the law to take its course. But within the ANC, you have said that when there are people that are harming the, 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 the organization, which is what the diagnostic report is talking to, especially in relation to the Gupta family, why are you not merciless against them within the party? Integrity Commission is there, you've got disciplinary processes that are there. Why are you not taking action against those within that are implicated? Look, the, the African National Congress took a decision that if, uh, if there, are, there are serious tested allegations against you, irrespective of your position, we took that decision in Mangawu, action has to be taken against you. Now, those who are making accusations against you must bring fourth prima facie evidence on the basis of which uh, action has to be taken. Now, I don't control the disciplinary committee of the African National Congress. It's an independent uh, committee of the ANC. I'm sure they can respond to the question as to whether these members of the ANC, because the Gupta uh, family members are members of the ANC, uh, some of them, in their capacity as ANC members, I don't know. It's up to the DC to decide whether they should be calling in them and say, look, there are all these things that are coming up now. As a member of the African National Congress, there's a thin line between uh, what is being propagated in public and what you are propagating. Clarify us. If they think there's a need for action to take, let Do you not think be. that they should be actually starting that process, the Integrity Commission? Well, the integ that's the DC. The Integrity Commission has got the right, independent of the NEC, to arrive at that particular decision. Now, you know what is the problem in South Africa? When certain things happen and the NC acts in a particular way, we are then told that the NC is dictatorial and so on. If the NC, as the executive, is to take a decision that integrity committee are going to do the following things. People are going to say, we are becoming dictatorial, we are undermining but the independence. The I, I get what you are saying. But you'll be saying you are undermining the independence of the, of the integrity uh, committee. So. Until the integrity committee itself sits on its own and say, we think we must look at this particular uh, matter, we can't push it further. Are you disappointed in the fact that it hasn't done it? All we've heard as far as the integrity commission is concerned is that it had planned to meet with the president a number of times and not to bring charges against him. It has so met with the president. Not, as I'm saying to you, not to do that or to meet to the president, not to try and charge him because they believe he's bringing the party into disrepute and he's damaging the brand ANC. What do you think of that? Are you worried that it's lagging in, it doing its, in discharging its duties? One of the, the, there are two things we have to understand here. The first one is that uh, the integrity committee is not a court of law, right? Yes. The expectation yes. from the public is that it must act like a, a court of law. Now, it's a court of morality, it's a court of morality for the ANC and that's what it needs that's, to that's act with I'm the mind. Coming. That's where I'm coming to, that the report on the meeting between the president and the integrity committee was reported to the national executive committee on two occasions to say that the integrity committee has met with uh, the president. It's not only the president. If the integrity committee sees something about me in the media or somebody reports about me to the integrity, they can call me to say clarify the following uh, things. Now it's up to them after meeting me or after meeting any leader including the president to say based on what we heard now from this member of the NC or from the leader. What do we think must be our way forward? The second thing that I think South Africans have to understand about the Integrity Committee is that uh, it's fairly a new uh, committee. It's a new phenomenon within the ANC. It will continue to face teething uh, problems until it reaches a stage where it's able to operate efficiently. The third thing, which was discussed in the NEC, was that uh, there began to emerge reports that uh, somehow uh, the Integrity Committee is being influenced, right? Which means that uh, its decisions or recommendations will be suspect. Now, if you have such a committee uh, being suggested to operate in a way that it may be influenced by some people, it will be better to protect and defend the integrity of the Integrity Committee 
by first engaging that particular matter, looking at the veracity of certain things, because the NEC received um, some letters and so on, which, whose details I can't get into here, which were said to have been drafted somewhere and so on. And the NEC said, maybe as we go to the national conference now in December, we must look at how we must deal with the integrity of the integrity committee itself. <laughs> Is that not deflecting? I mean, these are the, these are your stalwarts. Yes. These are your stalwarts. Yes. These are people that you're supposed to be drinking the well of wisdom, uh, so to speak. How do you then challenge their integrity? No, it's not uh, challenging their individual uh, integrity. It is the, the structure uh, itself. Because you have to look at the veracity of that perception or that allegation that the integrity of the integrity committee is being questioned by some members. So I suppose those discussions will be concluded uh, in December. As a province, our proposal is that uh, as a country, we must actually deal with the, with, with the, the, the cause of crime and corruption. And the province is saying the cause is greed. We think the ANC must take a decision that says there must be all-round mobilization throughout the country to deal with greed and see if you can start children from as far young as great R to teach them about morals, about ethics, about those things so that um, they can learn to become better human beings uh, tomorrow uh, in future. So, How do you teach your leadership? I mean, those are the things that President Jacob Zuma has been accused of. Oh, leadership must continue to, it's not proven. Leadership must continue to make sure that as a leader, you always look at yourself at all times as to whether what you do is not driven by greed. But remember, there's also a problem here in South Africa that we get accused of many things, right? And as, as a leader, my own personal view is that uh, when you get accused of many things, it's not uh, the most preferable option to want to chase people who are accusing you because you are a leader. So you must accept that you'll be criticized, there'll be concoctions against you and so on. Otherwise, you, wouldn't, you shouldn't have accepted to be in leadership. So we must live with the reality that some things will be cooked against us, some things will be true, others will be perceptions, but we must appear to the public to be doing something about these things that are being um, alleged against us. And this is what the commissions are going to be, to be dealing with. Super, it almost feels like there's a problem with the country you serve, you know? Many times you speak about the problems with South Africans and now we understand the ANC. Can I just ask for a quick assessment on what you made of yesterday, you know, when the president was speaking? A lot of us came to conclusions about how delegates seem to feel about the president, seem to feel about the leadership of the ANC. In your own views, how was yesterday? Brilliant. You know, yesterday I was asked a question in the morning before we start, and I said, these are exciting times for not only the ANC, but for the people of South Africa, right? Why am I saying so? We must never strive to have a, a homogeneous African National Congress, never. We must have an ANC where ideas can be allowed to flourish, no matter how extreme those ideas are. Those must be the strengths of the African National Congress. Which other organization in the world can you show me where a membership of the ANC or a leadership of the ANC is able to say uh, the president must be must re resign or exit from his position. Now, that shows the extent of democracy within the African National Congress. But you saw also that uh, what some analysts and uh, media people were saying that the president is going to be booed and all those things, those things did not happen. You know why? Because people respect their leadership and people understand that uh, it is their responsibility as members of the ANC to make, to make sure that there's stability within the ANC, there's discipline within. But those things don't exist right now in the ANC. Yeah. There, there's a lot of discipline here. We're not hearing a lot of discipline. In fact, the, 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 the issue is about whether or not the president's going to be asked to go. And I was actually going to ask you about that. The delegates, I've spoken to many delegates and branch leaders saying they've been waiting for a chance to speak because the last time they had a chance to sit in a room with their leaders was, was the NGC where there were assumptions and perceptions of corruption, but since then a lot has emerged and a lot of it has the president at the center and saying that they want a chance to be heard. Have they been heard? We've got four days now remaining. 
delegates were had yesterday. There was a hot discussion there yesterday which was very interesting in the nature of the African... What was it about? Uh, about the diagnostic report, right? Which was very interesting because if the ANC had suppressed uh, that debate, then the ANC will not true to its principle of democracy. We are a democratic uh, organization. It's not only about standing up in plenary. Delegates are allowed to write. Uh, there's a form there that you fill in. You are allowed to write to the steering committee and so on, and they can call you, you can uh, present to them, or you can speak in plenary, or you can speak in uh, commissions. But if the ANC wants to say that it is serious about dealing with corruption, if it's serious about saying that it does or not want leaders that bring the party into disrepute, you have a president who was found by the highest court in this country to have violated the very essence of what this country is, which is the constitution, and you continuing to keep him there, how do you discipline anybody else that follows? No, the, the conclusion of the court was not that the president has uh, flouted the... He failed to uphold it. Right? it. It didn't say so. Now, when you look at the requirement in the, in the constitution with regard to what people are saying to say he flouted the constitution and say, well, the constitutional com uh, court didn't say that. It was a breach of his ethical office. Now, of the, the, what the constitutional court said was that things that happened, for instance, around Nganda and so on, and how they were dealt with, to a certain extent, they were inconsistent with some of the prescripts of the Constitution, but he didn't say the president has flouted. But he did. He failed to uphold, protect, and defend the constitution. Yes. He also said it was a breach of his ethics. Exactly. I hear that. But what I'm saying is that the con the constitutional court did not emphatically what say that uh, the president has flouted uh, the constitution. He <laughs> just said he acted those. inconsistent with some sections of the constitution. That's what the constitutional Which court. Is his because oath. if if what you are saying is, is the case. Why are we not in court now? Why has the president not been taken to court? But that's not the constitutional court's yes. mandate. That was not their mandate. Everybody has got the right to say to go back to the constitutional court and say, hey, constitutional court, you said the following, and uh, it looks like uh, what you said is not being respected. So that the constitutional court itself can say, yes, this is what we said. So you, have, you are literally sitting in front of us, refusing to admit what is fact. As South Africans, this is now where I'm battling. As South Africans, how do we then expect the NC to actually emerge united, stronger, with what South Africans need in mind, with what the country's, what's best rather, for the country in mind when they leave Nazareth? Because you can't even admit what everybody knows came out of the highest court in the land. No, no, no. no. I'm saying... We agree with the court that there was some inconsistency in as far as the responsibility that is expected of the presidency from the constitution is set, as said by the constitutional court. We agree to that, right? And we have discussed that in the NEC, we have discussed that in parliament. We went to all the regions and branches in the country to discuss that particular matter. And the final determination of the African National Congress through its structures. Remember, NEC members went to provinces, to the regions, and we met for two days and discussed this particular matter, was that there was no need to remove the president from the position based on the explanation that was uh, given by the leadership and the, and, and the fact that uh, the president himself did explain how some of the things unfolded there in as far as uh, the decision of the Constitutional Court uh, is concerned. So, you know, South Africans, basically, what you're saying to them is that if they're unhappy with the fact that the NC is unable to remove the president, they can punish you in 2019. Well, I'm not saying that. It's not about punishing and so on. The Constitution of South Africa guarantees every voter to, to vote for a part of his or her choice. It's not about punishment and, and so on. That right is there every five years from 1994. So when you go and vote there, you must have your own uh, compelling reasons why you want to vote for this party or you don't want to vote for this particular uh, party. But I must also deal with the myth that says that the majority of uh, South Africans do not want uh, President Zuma. I ask people, if there are 60 or 70,000 people who march out of 53 million people, they march in Pretoria, right? They can march thrice, 15 times, 20 times, and so on. 
What makes us to come to the conclusion that the majority of South Africans don't want President Zuma? Now, I have said we are a democratic state. Simple, simple, right? Why don't people who are saying the majority of South Africans say President Zuma must go, why they don't they say there must be a referendum? So that uh, the majority of South Africans, through a legitimate constitutional democratic process, can indicate whether they want President Zuma or not. Then the matter will be settled. Would the ANC give the people a, the referendum? You can't, can't have people in WhatsApp and Facebook but, and... <laughs> and in some newspapers, and, and I'm not saying that uh, we shouldn't listen to the issues that people are raising. We must listen to them, and we must go and sit down with people. They must uh, criticize us to whatever extent that they want to, uh, right? As the ANC, we must humble ourselves. When we make mistakes, accept uh, that we have made uh, mistakes and face people, face their reality. Where we need to act against ourselves, we must act and move forward. Obviously, you, 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 you talked about the referendum. Uh, the president is the one that decides whether there should be a referendum. But as the ANC, do you think the ANC should be pushing for that referendum to happen then? Well, as a province, we are pushing for a referendum to amend some sections of the constitution in the country. Our view is that uh, this uh, matter of land must be given the necessary attention. But if you use parliament to deal with amendments in the constitution, people are going to go to court and you might lose the case. So we are suggesting that South Africans must suggest new sections that must be inserted in the constitution, sections that must be amended, and those proposals must be put through a referendum. And if they've gone through the referendum, it then means that nobody can rush to court to challenge it because it's not parliament. It will have been closed. It is the final view of the people of South Africa. One of the proposals we are, we are making is that um, the state must determine the price of land, right? And we call that price of land reconciliation and healing price tag. Because the, the, the preamble of the constitution says we must heal the wounds of the past. Now, part of the wounds is the land issue. So those who have taken the land must forego something, and those who lost the land must also forego uh, something. So, so that you create a win-win uh, for the country. And then we must say for a certain period, maybe 20 years or 30 years, the price of land shall, shall be determined by the state. We offer you a price as the state. If you don't take uh, the, the price of land, is then that we can go to taking land without compensation. We don't think it, 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 we must start by taking land without uh, compensation before we go through that particular step because we have a responsibility to reconcile the country. So you'll corner the people with land in essence. If you give an offer, they don't take it, then you take the land anyway. Yes, you, but we, of course. I mean, remember this, this land was taken by force, right? <coughs> fair, fair it was point. brutal. Uh, we are very nice now. I mean, if there were videos and we were to play, to replay how this land was, it was brutal. People lost lives and so on. But because we are building a country now and we must reconcile, we must heal, uh, we, we don't think that uh, you must take everything from everybody who took away land uh, by force because you still need them to contribute to the construction of a better South Africa. But Supra, this issue of changing the constitution, comes at a time when the ANC government for 23 years has missed its own deadlines for redistribution. I mean, 2014, I think the, the figure was 30%. And then you've got basically n almost 90% of the land that has been given back standing fellow because people don't have uh, what is needed to actually uh, produce from those lands. It's, it's a failure of government to implement, and now you want to even go and get even more. One of the problems we have in this country, why land uh, reform has moved slowly, is because there's overpricing. No, no, I'm uh, talking about land, land that has already been given back, that has I'll, been I'll come to that second point. And it has yes, I'll come to that one. The, the reason why land can be redistributed quickly, there's overpricing, and the state doesn't have sufficient capital to buy this land, this overpriced land, right? The second problem we have is that um, land that has been returned, yes, is lying fallow. That's why there's now agri-parks, right? There's now a program by government to make sure that we give people seeds, implements, training, and so on. But also there's a new model now 
of making sure that the farm owners and the farm workers or people who get the land back, you have a 50-50 kind of an arrangement where they work together. Those who have been running the farm for whatever number of years can then impart the knowledge and the skill so that you don't affect food security. So for me, that's a win-win that we need for South Africa going forward. We have learned our lessons. Yes, some, some land is lying fallow, but also we are a democratic country. If we give your land back and you decide not to develop it as a, as a person. But you risk f food security if we actually just allow yeah, it to Yeah, but land remember fallow. the land belongs to you. So we, we can't, it's a private land now, if we give it back to you. So we can't say to you, what must you do in your yard or uh, with your land and so on, unless you yourself take up an initiative and say, government, I've got this plan for this particular land. Can we help me? And government has got mechanisms of helping people. I know that we're running out of time, but I have to ask you, one of the heated issues or the heated debates we're expecting is around who is the enemy uh, for the National Democratic Revolution? Is it white monopoly capital or just monopoly capital? Where do you stand on that argument? The enemy against the National Democratic Revolution is imperialism, right? And imperialism in South Africa is expressed through ownership of, uh, and control of uh, banks, of land, of all monopoly industries. Now, who controls that? It's about 9% of the population of South Africa, which happens to be white, right? So we, we must confront imperialism and its manifestations. So if it manifests itself uh, in, in South Africa through what I've just said, um, uh, practical manifestations of imperialism, it means uh, that's the enemy of the revolution. That's why the strategy and tactics document says the relationship between us and white monopoly capital is of unity and struggle. It means you'll always struggle with them, but you also need them to build a new uh, South Africa. So that understanding, they must understand it. And being a Characterizing white monopoly capital as a problem in South Africa or as an enemy of the revolution doesn't mean that you are anti-white. The ANC is still committed to build a non-racial South Africa, right? But those who control the means of production must understand that they can use their control over the means of production to further annihilate blacks and Africans in this particular country. Your comrades within the ANC have said this whole ruse around white monopoly capital is just an attempt to factionalize the succession battle so that those that are saying that you don't need to racially define it are seen as anti-radical economic transformation. No, I, I don't agree with Gauteng. I think they must go and read the strategy and tactics uh, document properly, slowly and internalize it. The strategy and tactics document clearly says what happened here in South Africa is that blacks in general, Africans in particular, were annihilated by the colonialist and the apartheid system through law, right? It means there are things that uh, they acquired by using apartheid, colonialism, and they are still in control of that. Now, for us to change the society, that's why you've got triple BEE and all these other means of solving. Now, if Houghton doesn't believe that uh, you've got uh, that problem in South Africa, it means they're not pursuing triple BEE and other laws that are meant to redress these imbalances uh, of the past. And I don't think that uh, the objective is to try and uh, make sure that people are deflated or misdirected. And no, 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 no. Conference will come and go in December. You'll still have this problem of uh, white monopoly, monopoly capital. You are still going to have it, and we must still face it. It doesn't matter who you are going to have as president of uh, South Africa. That problem will still be there. My kids and your kids are still going to face uh, that particular problem for many, many years. Give yourself time and look at who controls the agricultural sector in this country. Right? Mm. From milk to spinach. It's white uh, monopoly <laughs> capital through uh, all these companies that they have uh, established. As far as December is concerned, this will be my last point. The province is saying we must find a way of 
creating a consensus among provinces on who especially must be the president of the African National Congress and the top seven or the top nine. Mm -hmm. We are suggesting yeah. top nine, right? Uh, so that, uh, yes, people have got the right to contest, but contestation can be costly, politically. It's democratic, but it can be very costly. So our view is that uh, we must avoid that route, even if it's democratic. Let's engage and agree. And uh, if there is consensus, we just go to conference and say there's consensus among the delegates. down on Kosazana Dlamini Zuma as a presidential candidate? We have never said we are supporting candidate. anybody as the province. Never. Never. We are going to make our views known in uh, September. But we agree with the Women's League on the principle that says the ANC has been in existence for over 105 years and the ANC believes in pursuing and building a non-sexist society, right? The ANC must answer a difficult question. Whether it's correct as an organization that pursues a non-sexist society for not having a president or an SG for over 105 years of ex its existence, but it pursues non-sexism. So we have to settle that issue first at the principle level before we talk about a name. It may not be even being Kosazana mm -hmm. after agreeing to the principle. So let's first agree on the principle. After agreeing on the principle, say, amongst the members of the African National Congress, who are the women that we think have got the necessary capacity, the history, the skills, the agility, the understanding, the flexibility, the vibrancy, to then lead uh, South Africa. If that's your principle, then it means that the Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa is then not in for the running for the top post because there is also another debate that's going on about the Deputy succeeding the President. I have, so, in our policy conference, I'm sorry to stop you, I've explained very slowly to Kwasatu and the SACP. I took my time just to explain to them. And I said to them, please read the Constitution of the ANC. It says, Anybody who is between 18, who is uh, more than 18 years and has spent not less than 10 years of unbroken service membership in good standing in the ANC is entitled to stand for any position in the ANC. It's in the Constitution, right? If we move from the premise that says, and not the name, the premise that says a deputy shall inherently proceed to become a president, we are flouting the Constitution. <laughs> what we must say is that we want to exercise that right that is in the Constitution, right? Everybody must have the right to stand. And we must say, in addition to everybody having the right to stand, we are suggesting that, uh, this is what I suggested to them, that they must refine their proposal. We are suggesting that uh, maybe the deputy uh, president, but not in his capacity as deputy president, as a member by title instead of the constitution, must then become uh, uh, the president. Because I said to them, if that is the case, that the deputy must proceed to become president, then it means the position must be uncontested. No, I've explained to the branches last week in our, our policy conference that uh, my own view is that uh, when my term ends in 2019, and I'm not re-elected as the provincial uh, chairperson, I want to go back to Ward 12. That's my branch <laughs> in Mahikin. And I want to focus on two things. Uh -huh. Political education and uh, making sure that we do campaigns on the ground. That's what I want to focus on. That's why I'm not available for the NEC, for any position in the National Executive. So in December, you're not available for NEC? No. I've already stated that in the branches uh, in the province, I'm not available. Remember, as I say, I'm also already an ex-officio member yeah. Yeah. of the NEC, so why should I stand? I mean, and branches elected me for four years. Why don't I finish my, my four years? I can't halfway uh, now detour, uh, you know, and go to the national. I also want us to teach our membership that uh, in the ANC, it's not only about going up. It must also be about going down. And just be ordinary, do work on the branches. 
Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, uh, Supra. Thank you very much for coming to our special edition of Politiki. Please stay listening. It's available on www.news24.com. And that's it from us. It's been an hour-long conversation with the uh, chairperson of the ANC in the Northwest and also Premier Supra Mahuma Pelo. And that's it for now from Politiki.